Every Friday, saxophonist Bill Saxon hosts a night of straight-ahead jazz at Bill's Place on 133rd Street in Harlem. Friends will stop by after their downtown gigs to take part in the second set, which can last well into the next morning. While uptown performances like this are less common today, 80 years ago Harlem was a hotbed of jazz, especially on West 133rd Street between Lenox and 7th Avenues. Today the site is a quiet residential street, but it's not too difficult to imagine what it must have been like in the late 1920s, early 1930s, say 4 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, throbbing with activity, cars and taxis honking, people calling out to one another, and music spilling out of the basements. Much like 52nd Street later on, the musicians were able to hop from club to club, sit in with one another, and hear each other's sets. West 133rd Street grew with the help of Prohibition, which drove city nightlife underground. In contrast with most Harlem spots, such as the Cotton Club, the jazz clubs of 133rd Street were African-American owned and integrated from the outset. A glance down the block gives us a sense of just how popular this scene became. At number 168, there was Pods and Jerry's Log Cabin, a celebrity hangout where the house pianist was the great Willie the Lion Smith. At 154, there was Club Mexico, a true musician's hangout described by Duke Ellington as the hottest gin mill on 133rd Street. Number 148 was Tilly's Chicken Shack, where the masterful Fats Waller was one of the house pianists. One night, he played My Blue Heaven here 25 times in a row, having been promised a drink for each play. Tilly's was founded by a woman named Tilly Fripp, who came to New York from Philadelphia with just $1.98 in her pocket, opened her own restaurant, and became so successful that she eventually oversaw a chain of chicken and waffle restaurants. Today, Bill's Place gives new life to Tilly's, bringing jazz back to the street. 133rd Street, became a part of that underground dark side of the illegal bootleggers. And so bootlegging, which at that time they used to call it bathtub gin, however you want to call it, they made alcohol anyway, and they served it. In some kind of way, the police precinct and the politicians and the people who were in charge of bootleggers, uh, they agreed that they would have a certain area uptown where you could come late in the evening after the closing of all the joints and spots downtown and drink and they did so and this was one of the locations that they called a speakeasy and on this block both sides of the street you had more speakeasies between Lenox Avenue and 7th Avenue on 133rd Street than anywhere else in the city and that's why they called it Swing Street the lot at number 146 once housed Edith's Clam House, which opened in 1928 and was known as a showcase for singer and pianist Gladys Bentley. Known today as a gay and lesbian pioneer, Bentley sang in top hat and tails, inventing risque lyrics for popular songs. Finally, at number 169, there was the club that started it all on West 133rd Street, The Nest. So we're standing in front of the former Nest Club on West 133rd Street. It opened in 1923, and this really became the first jazz club to open on West 133rd Street and really gave birth to New York City's jazz performance culture as we know it. It also inaugurated the development of this entire block as a jazz district. It really became a place where people of diverse races mingled at a time when other nightclubs throughout Harlem were strictly segregated. So we're going to take a look inside and see what it looks like today. Okay, so we're standing in the former Nest Club space here on 133rd Street in Harlem. And as you can see, it's really dilapidated. And it's hard to know that this was really one of the most significant cultural spaces in the city. Um, this is where jazz performance culture was really fostered. Of course, some of the great musicians who performed here were Sam Wooding, 
uh, the band leader, and Lewis Russell. And of course, uh, a lot of celebrities came here as well. Mae West came here very often. Reportedly, she was dating one of the owners. Uh, this club was African-American owned, like all of the clubs on West 133rd Street. And just to give you a sense of how tight the space really was, you can imagine the band performing over on this side, up against this wall here, and uh, the audience being seated all around on this side. And really where I'm standing would have been the dance floor. So you had performers, musicians, audiences, um, dancers, all inhabiting this really tight space and what I find so special about the Nest Club and all of the clubs on 133rd Street in general was that uh, they were integrated from the outset basically white patrons sat next to patrons of color and everyone was kind of mingling together and I think the fact that we are here in a basement uh, also contributed to that feeling of being kind of out of the way and uh, the environment was really one in which social boundaries could come down. Being in this space where human beings were able to truly interact with one another without sort of fear from the outside contributed to the growth of experimentation in jazz and allowed these musicians who performed here to really be loose and be themselves. Pianist and composer Dr. Billy Taylor arrived in Harlem after the Prohibition era, but felt the spirit of the street. Among the places Taylor played was the Rhythm Club, which once occupied the same space as the Nest. Well, it wasn't the, the size of the club uh, so much as it was the uh, um, intimacy. It, it, it was, uh, uh, you, you, you got to talk to and play for people, you know, and, and everybody was, it was a room this, this size, and, and, you know, there was somebody over there, yeah, well, you know, you, he was in the conversation and, you know, that kind of, and, and uh, uh, I remember going to, to uh, the, the Rhythm Club and other, other clubs like that. It was like being at home. I mean, you, you, you felt comfortable there. It wasn't like downtown. It wasn't like the Bronx. It wasn't uh, like other places. It had, it had its own uh, uh, kind of camaraderie. And, and uh, people would come from the Bronx or from, from Long Island or something to come, to come to Harlem and then go back home, you know? We get so much from listening to the records and we can read about it in a book and we can do all the studying and listening we want, but actually standing here in this space and seeing where the performances were actually made can give us such perspective because we really can view sort of and understand the physical dynamics through which this great music was created. Mm -hmm. 